Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, as you heard, just I'm um, Martin. I'm here from Rapid7. I work here as a lead software engineer, and I will share with you a story how we uh, arrived at a low tech ETL. So the organization where I work here at Rapid7. Uh, uh, is vulnerability management. Uh, my team in particular is responsible for vulnerability content. That means that we build our internal database of vulnerabilities, which is then used by our product to scan for these vulnerabilities in environments of our customers. So we report them for whichever vulnerability they have in their environment. And we, and my team, is building the database. So we source different vendors. Um, this vendor can be Microsoft, Cisco, Red Hat, and all of them are publishing information whenever they have some vulnerability in their product. We collect this data, we then transform it and store it into the database. When we are lucky, uh, this data is disclosed in some machine readable format, but quite often it happens that it's not. So uh, it's just some HTML uh, blog post that they will write on their uh, website. And we need to handle somehow the transformation into the standardized schema that we use. Um, I will be talking about yeah, that part, about the ETL um, and about uh, our way of, to this uh, low-tech ETL, how I've called it. So to give you a bit more characteristics, uh, we are sourcing around 100 vendors. Each of that vendor we download daily. So daily we connect to them and download all the data. It varies a lot how much they adv uh, advisories, that means vulnerability advisories they publish. It can be tens, it can be ten thousands. Uh, and mostly it's quite simple, simple flow. So we download it, we transform it, we store it. So it's just one job uh, that's being run. Um, up until the point that I've joined the company, uh, this was done quite naively, you could say, just uh, as a process running on some server somewhere hosted on AWS, uh, not like some physical machine, hopefully. But uh, still, uh, it was uh, just cron job, cron tab job that was run there. And this wasn't uh, really a sa good solution because, um, yeah, for example, if we something went wrong, we had to SSH to that machine and just check the logs there, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, Around the time I've joined, uh, we've started thinking about ways how we could improve that. And as the first step, we wanted to replace the platform where we run our ETLs. So we've started looking into different options. And the first one that we uh, explored is Prefect. I'm not sure. Is anyone here familiar with Prefect? Oh. Few hands. So it's a new up and coming uh, data orchestrator platform. It has quite elegant UI, at least uh, to my taste. It was very user-friendly. Uh, it's very uh, tied to Python. So the way you define a task there is just really by a decorator on your function. So you put this task decorator on your function, and then it's, when it gets deployed to the perfect uh, environment, it will automatically pick that up as a function. It will show it the runs in this uh, UI, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, uh, it's quite tightly coupled with Python. Um, also, the task hierarchy is uh, determined by the calls. Uh, so if you have task that's calling another task, it will be split into this chart. Uh, it has built-in alerting. So uh, that was something that we uh, were looking for to get uh, notifications to Slack. Uh, but then um, if we would be... Um, if we would select this platform, we would need to set up uh, the runtime environment in our uh, our AWS environment, or we would need to use their hosted solution, which can be a bit pricey. Uh, internally, we would need also to approve Prefect to be used. Uh, and the one like disadvantage that, uh, from my point of view, this uh, this um, orchestrator has is that it's really focused on Python. So if you want to run some workload that's not Python, you need to write a wrapper, like basically uh, write Python function that will execute some process. And then you are kind of losing a lot of the benefits because, um, for example, the logs are not collected as nicely, et cetera, et cetera. 
So, and that's something we knew that we are going to do. So in the end, we said uh, no to perfect um, and we kept on looking and uh, we looked inside our company and we learned that few teams are actually using Apache Airflow, which uh, I think some of you might be familiar with. Um, but frankly, that was about the advantages of Apache Airflow that we have identified. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm not a big fan, <laughs> but I've also never used it, so I can't criticize too much. But it was just too complex for our use case. Um, uh, I uh, think uh, it would require, require quite a lot of investment from our side to educate all the developers about all the airflowisms that they are, there are. Uh, also, the definition of the task to me seemed quite complicated. Um, and uh, in addition, it does not play nicely with poetry. I'm not sure whether that's been fixed since, but uh, at that point, uh, it wasn't just uh, usable. Yeah, so in the end, we said no to Apache Airflow either, and we kept on looking. And uh, then we've realized that uh, another tool that we are already using is Kubernetes, and they have something called cron jobs. And uh, it kind of does what we need. So. You can define schedule for the cron job. It has three tries if the uh, cron job fails. Um, all of our developers were already familiar with Kubernetes and most of them also with Terraform where we define our Kubernetes resources. Uh, all of them have open lens already installed which is the graphical user interface where you explore your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so really the knowledge uh, was there in the company already. And in addition, it's language agnostic. So whatever you can run on Kubernetes, you can run as a Kubernetes cron job. So uh, there are of course some, um, uh, some uh, downsides. So as I said, the UI is not dedicated to cron job. So it's a bit clunky. It's not as nice as, as perfect. Uh, unfortunately, there is no built-in monitoring. The task ordering is a little awkward because the way we currently do it is that we define the first task to be, if there is like some dependency, the first task to be run, for example, at 10, 10 a.m. and then the second at 11. And we kind of hope that the first one is finished by that time, which like, it works, but <laughs> until it doesn't, right? So um, yeah, for now, it's working. Uh, so. <laughs> We've selected Kubernetes Chrome Jobs as our ETL platform. Um, so that we have the platform where to run. And then we were thinking how to organize our code base. Because we have quite a big organization. It's around 40 developers uh, in our yeah, bigger team. Uh, they are distributed over three locations. So we are, we are here in Prague, in Toronto, in Belfast. Uh, so we need to be quite loosely coupled. So the decision was made that each of the ETL will have its own repository, which is quite a bold decision because then you need to make sure that it somehow gets standardized and that it won't diverge and everything won't be like totally different. So one way we are doing this is that we have a short code and an internal PIF package. And in addition to that, we are using cookie cutter and craft. These tools are for um, setting up a new project. So what Cookie Cutter does is that it will enable you to define a project template. And from that project template, you then can then initialize other projects. So for example, here you can see, I don't know sure whether it's visible, but you can see that in this query brackets, uh, there is like placeholder value and that will be filled during the initialization. So with this project template, we initialize the project structure. We also set up the pre-commit hooks, all the linters and formatters, and that quite uh, uh, at least put us on a good path to follow the standard structure that we would like to have in these ETLs. And then the other tool, Craft, is tightly coupled with Cookie Cutter. It's to uh, enable us to keep these projects in sync with the original template. So what Craft does is that it remembers the original commit hash of the project template when it was initialized. And then when you want to update, it will look for all the changes that happened to that template since that commit, and it will apply those changes to your project. 
So if there are some changes to the template, you can just uh, reflect the changes into your project. Um, yeah, so that works also quite nicely. So now we had our platform, we know how to organize the code base, but what about the code itself? So the biggest challenge for us uh, is, as I said before, uh, that sometimes these vendors are not disclosing these vulnerabilities in machine-readable format. That means that we need to somehow parse text that uh, just states which version for which product are vulnerable and we need to extract the information. So the traditional way how we would approach this is to use beautiful soup or some other library to do HTML parsing, but that's not really reliable and frankly quite annoying. So what we, did we do? We used AI. <laughs> so, so. So that's uh, actually a um, nice uh, continuation of our previous talk because we are using LLMs to extract JSON. Uh, so we asked the LLM to give us the information that we need and it just that, does that. And it turns out that it's quite a good use case <laughs> for LLMs because it's, uh, the context is quite limited, right? Every information that the LLM needs to know is in the advisory. So. And then uh, it's also capable of uh, producing this structured format, uh, also utilizing uh, some of the tools that uh, my predecessor talked about. And yeah, in general, we are quite happy with that. Uh, and actually, it, yeah, it's not multi-agent system, it's just one agent, and we are not leveraging any of the frameworks that uh, uh, was talked about. Uh, so that only demonstrates that you really don't actually need the framework, but yeah, I, 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 um, yeah, it gives you a lot of things. Yeah, so that's for the, for the code base. And then the last unconventional thing that we do is that we use Git as our database. <laughs> so when I've joined Rapid7, this really um, felt weird to me because um, as a software engineer, I know that I shouldn't commit to Git anything that's, um, yeah, like files, and lots of them. And here there was Git repository when with uh, one and a half million files uh, currently <laughs> and counting. Uh, and yeah, so it felt weird. But I kind of uh, came to appreciate it because everyone knows Git. Uh, all of our developers know Git, so they don't need to learn about new database. Uh, it has some nice features like uh, change tracking, so if we need to find out why some content, as we call it, the vulnerability has been changed, we can just go to Git and see the history and determine like why and when some automatization has gone wrong. Uh, it has uh, tools for validation, so sometimes we need, before we include the changes to our database, we need to validate them, so we can do that using GitHub PRs. It has some downsides. So for example, full clone of that repository takes about 40 minutes. Uh, that's uh, not uh, perfect, uh, but fortunately, uh, you only ever clone it once to your computer. It poses some issues when you then want to clone it in a CI CD pipeline to do some testing validation because uh, yeah, it, it's taking some time. There are some workarounds. We are doing sparse checkouts. Uh, so yeah, you, you can work around it, but yeah, it, it, there's some extra work that needs to be done. Yeah. And that's about it. That's uh, our low-tech ETL. It schedules jobs using Kubernetes cron job. Uh, we manage the code base using cookie cutter as a template, and then to reflect out the updates to the original template, we use Craft. Uh, it leverages LLMs instead of imperative HTML parsing, so instead of telling how, we say what, and we store uh, data into Git repository. So that's how we built an ETL platform with zero innovation tokens spent using just the tools that we already are using. <laughs>